Welcome back to Two Creeks Farm, coming to you out of Bowden, Georgia today. And today we have a little bit of a different topic for you. And the topic has to do with something that Mark and I discovered that we have in common in our histories, and that is a kind of penchant for collecting things over time. So, for instance, uh, I brought a little show and tell for you, and this has to do with a, a little bit of a coin collection that I amassed in uh, years years ago and this one has to do with a uh, what are called walking liberty half dollars and uh, you know they're they're sort of uh, aesthetically appealing and historically appealing and we sort of want to get into the whole psychology what is the psychological structure of the will to collect and amass and so on and uh, I suppose that one way of getting into that would be uh, to sort of first make note of a Freudian take on it although that's a little bit old school so the Freudian take on it would probably reside in two insights, one of which has to do with what Freud called the oral stage. And in the oral stage of development, which would map onto chronologically our infancies, what we learn is what it is to take things into our body, especially by way of, of feeding and so on and so forth. And that if we, if we get kind of stuck in those issues and don't resolve them completely, according to his point of view, uh, we end up living out those issues in adulthood and what those issues would have to do with is something like uh, trying to sort of uh, take into our figurative bodies more more than our literal bodies and make them bigger and bigger and bigger so collecting would be comprehensible from a Freudian perspective in that way and the second way uh, perhaps has to do with sort of anal retention which is sort of not just a will to collect that's more uh, the oral stage stuff but the the uh, if you have problems sort of eliminating as it were, <laughs> part of your collection, well that would have to do with sort of uh, anality, which is the next stage in the Freudian scheme, and sort of trying to retain things as much as possible. And the interesting thing is that there seems to be some commonality too in the, the way we took up collecting as children, and the way many of you may have done the same thing if you were collectors of anything. For example, baseball cards uh, yeah. we decided we took those up at around eight years of age yeah. um, and then stamps at like I think I was 12 I think I was a little older I think I was in my teens when I sort of got into that and um, but with baseball cards I wasn't consciously aware that I was collecting yeah. I was just accumulating yeah, me too. And trading, having fun yeah. trading with other kids. Yeah, and with with the stamps, I was I was aware, I was consciously aware that I was doing that, and coins too. I sort of got into coins because of my dad. But um, there is a there's a historical kind of appreciation there for those kinds of things. <clears throat> but then we were also talking about before we started taping things like. Um, uh, common common kinds of things that are collected the hot wheels the little racing the little metal racing cars from the 60s and early 70s uh, hot wheels johnny lightning matchbox i had those the oldest hot wheels were the red lines they had the little red pinstripe uh, instead of a white wall on the tires it was a red line and so those were collected because we wanted to play with the cars now people our age are collecting them because they have this historical attraction and because they it's kind of a reclamation of this uh, sense of being a child again yeah I think so that especially among the boomers I, uh, Mark and I are uh, probably late boomers they sometimes make a distinction between sort of early boomers those are people who born uh, about 10 years after World War II and then later boomers who were born after that but are still regarded as the boomer generation. At any rate, I think uh, people who are boomers um, have gotten to the point where, first of all, uh, they have the means to sort of reclaim these little bits of their youth. And uh, they have a nostalgia, I think, very often we have nostalgia for the things that used to give us joy and that are associated with pleasant memories in our youth and probably stuff that we long ago got rid of. But like as adults, we would like to, wow, wouldn't it be neat? I wish I hadn't gotten rid of that. And, uh, you know, that, that fuels entire cottage industries on eBay, uh, as, as you might be aware, of uh, lunchbox collectors and sellers and Hot Wheels and toys of various kinds and uh, model rockets and 
uh, all kinds of stuff like that. But I think that psychologically what it's about is uh, like trying to sort of revivify in a way mm -hmm. uh, that those the nice, pleasant, wonderful times of childhood and have a, a lived connection to them as adults. And there is um, there's so many aspects of, of this collecting. Um, another thing that we had talked about, that of course, there's the Cabbage Patch Kids, which I, I didn't really, um, that really wasn't on my radar anywhere, even as a kid or an adult. But, but my mother, as a middle-aged woman, 25 years ago, and all of her friends stood in line before dark sometimes, I mean before, before dawn sometimes, in the dark, at these little shopping centers and, and different places to collect Beanie Babies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember that. Which they all thought, all the women that were with her, all thought that they would be have some value, some financial value, not just an emotional kind of a thing. And so now I'm sure there are um, elderly women all over the country uh, that are sorely disappointed that... <laughs> that they have these tubs full of Beanie Babies and can't really do anything with them except maybe right. give them to their cat or something. Well, I think part of what was going on with the Beanie Babies is there was a lot of uh, interest in them, first of all, which fueled a lot of uh, speculation, which drove the prices up high during that era. But one of the things you learn if you're an inveterate collector like Mark and myself is that if you're really collecting uh, for the speculative market value. Here we go, here's the cat. Um, try to get the cat into the picture. Um, you should not be collecting things that are expressly made to be collector's items for the most part. The odds of things that are expressly made to be collector's items, the odds of that paying off are extremely remote. Mm -hmm. The things that pay off are the things that never were intended to be collector's items as such, or investment items as such, things like lunch boxes and uh, baseball cards that we that were just common everyday items. Those are the things that are going to pay off, or coins, coins that were just, you know, had a purely utilitarian function. Come on. We have a third uh, guest here. Yeah, a special see guest. The third guest. Yeah, I can see her just a little there. <laughs> That's Suki. Uh, she's nine years old, and she prefers to be heard, not seen. Yes. <laughs> I think she has a hairball collection. She you? does. She quite, yeah, actually, we own it now, but um, <laughs> it's in that drawer over there. Um, but, uh, Eric, there's an interesting other element to this, though, especially, also, I'm going to stick with the Beanie Baby story for a minute, because a lot of those women did not know each other before. Usually there were two or three, you know, would go together. But some of these uh, groups would end up being 30 or 40 people waiting for these Beanie Babies. And so there was almost this kind of a camaraderie and a, um, uh, a collective um, shared interest. And some of them have friendships that have continued to this day that started with this complete other thing that they were doing hmm. as an intrinsic kind of a kind of motivation ended up being this external friendship and relationship to the other that they had um, that was had, had really no um, conscious part in the activity yeah well you, I think mark what you're getting at is the the social side to collecting right it's not just a matter of sort of collecting for yourself but you know, collecting often has this social dimension. In fact, when we started talking about stamps and coins and we started speaking in the lingo, we, we discovered that, holy crap, here's this other person who knows this rare language yeah. that hardly anyone else speaks. Yeah. Yeah. And this guy is, is fluent in it and I can drop these references and he'll instantly know what I'm talking about. And it, it makes you feel like a little connected, like there's kind of a kinship or something, like a secret kinship. Mm -hmm. among collectors and it's and it also it it brings up these reminiscent kinds of things from childhood mm -hmm. and those like you said earlier the those sort of good feelings and experiences of being with your the other kids that you knew that did the same things and uh, it was a it was a meeting point yeah. in time for this activity 
uh, but it had it had a very tangible therapeutic kind of thing you know element to it yeah like you're among your own kind or something like that yeah waiting for a sign from one of my kind that's actually a line from a concrete blonde song i believe you yeah (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) i'm an old rock player uh mark played more classical music during his upbringing and Mm -hmm. i I was sort of a rock and roller but anyhow yeah waiting for a sign from one of my kind Mm -hmm. and and so now um now you have uh, the re- the relationships that are maintained in some cases, and you have um, the item itself. In this case, the Beanie Babies has relatively no value, uh, yeah, right. e- even much less than what was paid mm-hmm. for it. I'm sure. Um, so that whole aspect has sort of been a discarded kind of a thing. But even today, if you ask my mom. 85 years old about her days of collecting those Mm -hmm. she will start to get she just kind of fades away when she's telling her stories about the different times and then there was this one time that they had this one special and and so there's that um, that that memory that uh, kind of stays with her and and remains special even to today yeah you know Mark and I were actually sharing part of our little coin collections uh, when we met this morning. And uh, as I was sort of trotting out some of mine, I remembered uh, things like how much I paid for each one. Mm-hmm. And this, this, some of those were, you know, probably 40 years ago I bought them. And I remember uh, like what holder it came in, like what the color of it was, and all these kind of weird, like almost strangely, almost too much detail kind of memories that would sort of pop up and and usually when I would remember these things I'd have like a really sort of warm feeling mm-hmm. like uh, about uh, sometimes I would remember the dealer that I would buy these things from you know the actual dealer or something that was said in the exchange of 40 years ago I mean it's really sort of crazy well it, it is and it isn't I the my dad mostly collected coins and he knew this was when I was around 12 or 13 and I had just gotten really gotten into collecting stamps and I really enjoyed it and he found uh, he came home with some new coins for his collection but he brought an entire box of stamps and a lot of them were from China or different parts of Asia and I was absolutely enthralled and fascinated Mm -hmm. And so I still have those memories of making my way through these boxes because the pictures on the stamps would almost transport me to the places and the countries and in my imagination yeah. would, would uh, develop this whole scenario. Yeah, for me, the role of imagination in collecting was is really important. And as a kid, much like you're speaking about, Mark, you know, I, I would collect coins and I would imagine the different hands that these coins mm-hmm. pass through and the different sort of sets of desires and worries and involvements that these these coins played some small part in people's lives. And I always preferred the worn coins for that reason. Although if you collect coins, the, the ones that everyone wants are the uncirculated ones, the ones that have had no wear. But in a way, I sort of preferred the circular, circulated ones. Uh, because they were bearers of human involvement, like every sort of little bit of wear was another sort of fraction of human involvement. And the sense of transport also, you were speaking about transport to distant lands, but transport over time, Mm. you know, is a big part of it for me, like uh, to collect something, to have a coin, let's say from the mid 19th century when the Civil War was going on, you know, uh, sort of transported me, like I had this sense of sort of being pulled to a different uh, sensibility because the coins, of course, have an aesthetic to them that's different from the aesthetic that we have today. And uh, they had sort of different, a little bit different language on them. And they had different uh, mint marks. Mint mark is a sort of letter that's on coins that tell you, tells you where it was made. So if I got something from the mid 19th century from New Orleans, which has an O mint mark on it, like I was suddenly drawn toward uh, Louisiana, mm-hmm. you know, during the mid 19th century, and uh, imagining like like what was going on when this thing was minted, and 
like how it was transported to the bank and who was the first person to get it perhaps from the bank and like uh, maybe maybe it was given to some kid as a birthday present and that kid cherished it so much because it was more money than the kid ever had and then the kid maybe eventually sold it for a teddy bear or something or you know whatever and and they stand for um they the items themselves in a way are are symbols they stand for they represent something that we can take up with our unconscious of because i'm speaking from a, a Jungian standpoint of um they they contain in a sense all of the antecedents that had that item before we did mm -hmm. and um, that is a, an extremely important part of the way we take up the appreciation of the historical perspective yeah. of these items yeah. um, so I think we just kind of made this uh, topic off the cuff uh, sort of, but it seems like that it there is some richness to this. Oh, I think so. And there is um, there's a lot more there there are a lot more aspects of collecting of things than um, than meets the eye. Yeah, that's for sure. I think it is very rich. Um, sort of looking at the time, we don't have much more time, but I sort of wanted to share a little story that happened last weekend. Uh, where the band was playing, the band I'm in, and there are two young guys in the band, both in their 20s, and so I decided to give uh, some old coins to both of these young guys. And uh, before I did that, I asked them, how many things do you own that were made in the 19th century? And, uh -huh. and both of the young guys said, zero things. <laughs> and I said, well, now you both own one. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it was sort of a Promethean moment, like it felt that way, like, like my particular older involvement in history and sense for history was being uh, sort of transferred or possibly transferred or at least given over mm -hmm. to this younger generation. Now these coins I gave them were coins that I'd collected when I was probably 12 years old. So they're, I, I've been holding them for almost 50 years, like 45 years. And here I am sort of in this weird uh, intergenerational moment of handing these sort of historical markers that are part of my life over to them, and who knows, you know, maybe that they'll go nowhere, or maybe they'll initiate something, but at any rate, I sort of wanted to include that. Nice. So that was that was a symbolic act yeah. that you did there. And, uh, yeah. well, pr and these guys are really bright and sensitive, and they, they got it, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's cool. Yeah. Well, Prometheus, thank you for sharing. Yes, and, uh, <laughs> of course. Yeah. You're Promethean yourself. You yeah. Know, so. And thank you for listening. Yes, and, thank you for and, uh, listening. Thank, uh, speaking of Promethean moments, if you had one during this video, that, that's great. That's awesome. Yeah, so we'd like to hear from you if you have any thoughts, and we'll see you next time. Take care now. Okay, I liked it. <laughs>